Elliott Sound Products, Project 27B, coming up on Astro's Electronics Lab. <laughs> Greetings, the Astro 30 here yet again. You can tell by the title of this video, I'm going to be building a guitar preamp today. Um, it's designed by ESP or Elliott Sound Products by an Australian electronics engineer named Rod Elliott. And there's a link in the description to the whole entire project which also covers the power amp. But I'm just building the preamp. Now, having a look at this, it's a very well designed board. Nice soldering pads very well designed uh, traces and fill-ins better than that uh, Electro India power amp but it is slightly bowed but that's neither here nor there and it's a fairly straightforward uh, thing to put together uh, you just have to follow the instructions on his website article now this board costs $19.80 it's just a blank board. There's no parts. You've got to provide your own parts um, Plus seven dollars postage and handling. So there's a copy of the invoice that got um, Sent with it. It's basically a printout of the online order form anyway, and um, Yeah, t total was twenty six dollars and eighty cents, which was nice now We're going to assemble this in this video and don't worry. I am going to be completing that Electro India power amplifier and revealing to you all what I'm doing but this might actually give you a clue. So comment down below and give me your ideas of what you think I'm actually doing. Obviously it's going to be a guitar amp but how am I doing it? I do actually have a reveal coming up shortly when I get some parts for the uh, Electro India power amp like a transformer for instance and all will be revealed in that video. But that's something to look forward to. But first we've got to assemble this. So I'm going to go ahead and start assembling this um, in just a moment. But we're going to look at some other stuff that I have received. Okay, so I've received a package from Alltronics Australia. So I'm just going to first get rid of this invoice. Still bumping up. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, I've got a catalogue H5141A, which is actually a 19 inch blank rack mount panel, one unit in size, so 44 millimeters. It's uh, what you use to fill in dead space on equipment racks. So there's the panel there, and that's going to form the basis of my front panel. And I've noticed that it is a bit scratched. It's also yeah, a rough powder coated surface. It's not a smooth surface. Uh, we're looking at least one and a half mil thick there. So that's going to be my front panel. I also got a bunch of parts from JCAR. Spent about $42 including shipping. I think it was $8 or $7 shipping there. Uh, there's no invoice, so I can't actually double check that, but I've got a bag of parts here like two IC sockets and a bunch of electrolytic capacitors and MKT capacitors. I've got two, a pack of five 1N4148 signal diodes, a packet of 680 ohm 1 watt resistors, 220 peak farad ceramic, some 10K, some 1K, 100K, 68K, Bunch of PCB pins for the circuit board. 33K, 4K7, uh, 220 ohm, and 1 mega ohm. So, all in all, I reckon this project cost me close to 90 bucks, not including the price of the circuit board, so well over 100 bucks in components. Now, this is subject to copyright, and I am kind of breaking Rod Elliott's copyright, however, 
This is taken off the public website. There is a link in the description to this whole entire project, including his power amplifier. And I'm only showing this here for completeness. There is no other text that comes off his website. I'm going to paraphrase basically how it works. So it's not direct plagiarism. Just getting that out there in the open. So we'll start over here at the input. Now, in his circuit, he uses OPA2134 op amps, and they're fairly expensive for an op amp. They're around about the $7 mark, but they're very high performance and very low noise. But you can just as easily use a JFET input op amp like a TL072, but I don't really want to use one of them, so I'm going to use an NE5532. Shouldn't make any difference. Now, over here we've got two inputs, high and low. Now they work basically opposite to what you might think, and it's the same basic idea on most guitar amps. They have a high and low, usually spelled H-I and L-O. The high input is used for normal or relatively low volume or low output instruments, such as uh, passive guitars, basses and stuff that don't have any active electronics, no preamplifiers, no active pickups or anything. And the low, is used for uh, higher output instruments such as keyboards and electrified basses that have a preamp in built, active pickups and active pickups in guitars. And when the high is switched to ground, it's actually switching this resistor to ground, so that's forming a potential divider across this 100k resistor here. So we get around about, I think it's a 12, maybe 18 decibel drop on the low input. So you could, for all intents and purposes, plug a line input in here and it won't distort the first stage. So it doesn't mean high volume input, low volume input. It's the other way around. Okay. That just goes into a standard non-inverting op-amp stage here. And he's got a brightness switch here, which is switching in this 22 nanofarad capacitor and one kilohertz, one kilohertz, 1K resistor to ground. And all that's effectively doing is adding a little bit more high end to the sound. It's a bit like presence on some guitar amplifiers, the presence control, except it's a switch. You can emit that if you don't want that feature. I'm going to include it because it's there. Next, the output of that is fed through these capacitors and these variable resistors. And basically, this arrangement here of the treble, bass, and mid, I did actually get the pots the wrong way around, the 10K is the mid. Um, this is basically the similar design to a Fender or a Marshall tone stack. It's passive and it does have quite a considerable amount of loss. Also, you cannot have all these controls at zero. You'll get no output. Just keep that in mind. Then the output is formed at the treble center tap position of the resistor into this 500K. The reason we're using a 500K is because this is a fairly high impedance circuit. And we're going into a high impedance input of the next stage, which is just basically a second amplifier. And with this 68K and this 4K7 resistor respectively, we're looking at a gain of roughly 15, 15.4 thereabouts. That's also a non-inverting stage. And if you find that this gain is too high, notice this is marked with a star, you'd increase this resistor. And uh, 10K is a good starting point. And that'll reduce your gain down to roughly 7.8 and then you just can go from there, if you find it's just a bit too much gain. And the way that this circuit is designed is your input stage, which is also set to a gain of 15, is when you wind up this volume control, the more and more gain you give this input, the more and more it's going to the store. That's where we come to the next interesting part. The more you push it, the more these four diodes which are set back to back, are going to start clamping the signal down. This is called a soft clipping circuit. So the more volume or gain you give this stage from that stage, and it starts to clip, this will soften off the clipping so it's not as harsh. 
and then you can actually use this as a drive controller. You can have it all the way up and get some serious distortion out of it, but it being clean distortion for a better term. I've never heard of uh, distortion that's clean, but anyway. This then goes into a non-inverting one-to-one -one buffer, so it's set to a gain of one. And that goes into our master volume control. Now there's no capacitor between here and there, but shouldn't be a problem. And then the wiper or the center goes out into this next non-inverting amplifier stage, which gives us a gain of two, because it's 10 divided by 10 is one plus one, is two. So the overall output gain here is two. And this is just to make sure that the power amp sees a low impedance input source. Originally Rod had a um, emitter follower transistor here, but it provided no gain. Uh, it does essentially the same thing, but this one provides a little bit more gain. Um, all in all, this should be enough to power that electro into your power amp quite happily to heavy amounts of distortion if one so desired. And finally down here, we've got a 15 volt Zeno diode rectifier circuit, for a better word, it's a dropper circuit with current limiters, which provides the positive and negative 15 volt rails for the op amps off of the main power amplifier supply. So you don't need a separate um, power supply to power or transformer. It will come straight off the main transformer, off the main power supply's filter caps. Um, and the voltage could be anywhere like from 35 plus minus to 50, 60 volts plus minus. Mine's going to be probably more the order of plus 30, or plus minus 30 I should say, but it will still work the same. These two capacitors are supposed to be ceramic. Um, I've got MKT instead and they're mounted as close as possible to each of the dual op amps. So now would be a good time to work out what I'm doing here. Now it's going to live on the other side of the panel here. Um, I'm just laying it out on the front here, pretty, pretty much where it is now. Which should give me enough room for the controls and inputs along here. I might even put it further over. I've got, I've got the room, might as well use it. That might be a better place to put it. But I need to find out what the uh, centers of those holes are. So I'll take a measuring tape and I'll set it on the 100 mark. It's uh, about 94, 93 between hole centers. Yeah, 93. So it's not exactly like within fives or tens. So that kind of is annoying. Okay, so I've got some clear sellotape here, but masking tape would have been better. I just don't have any. So once I find the end of this tape here, I'll rip off a bit of tape. Um, need a pair of scissors. Long enough. Whoops. Shit. It's only to guide me in the marking process because it's awfully difficult to mark on this unless you've got something white. Um, as I say, masking tape would have been better. It would show the mark up better. So I want to leave room for a power switch here. So, I might put that about there. Just work out uh, what my distance is. Uh, 80 mil, okay. So, I need to come in. 10 mil would be too much. So I'll make my initial mark in from the edge. Uh, 8 mil. Yeah, that's much better. It lines up. So that now will assist me in drilling those two holes after I center punch them, drill them out to 3mm and then I can bolt the circuit board to the inside of the panel. I don't have a center punch. Straight into the desk. Lucky it's my desk. All right, that's not too far off, so it's all right. Oh, that 
took a long time more than necessary. Okay. I don't think that one moved too much. It might be slightly off a bit, but that's all right. That's why center punch helps. Um, I've lost mine. Alright, there's no going back if this is wrong. Uh, it's not too bad actually. So then I can take the tape off. And we've got two nice holes. I'll clean the desk up in a minute, but my idea is I probably might actually go out and buy spacers. Is to put a couple of screws in here. And then on the other side, put some nuts. If I can sort of get these damn things started. I'm not going to tighten it up. It's all got to come back off again anyway. But for now, I'm just uh, retrofitting stuff at the moment. I'd probably use, if I was going to go this method, I'd probably use two nuts rather than one. But I just want to make sure. Yes, it will fit, but I might have to just massage the size of those holes a bit. That's a bit better, even though the board's slightly crooked because one of these holes is off. It does fit in there a little bit much more better. I made them 4mm holes. I mean, this is why it helps use a center punch, but just for the preamp module, I don't think it really matters that much of a great deal. So yeah, I think I'll use uh, metal spaces for this and... I'll put the spaces on the board first and then I can line it up to the holes on the front better. That way it'll be a lot easier. So that little mishap out of the way, I will find the center punch and center punch the uh, other holes that need to be drilled in it so that they all line up properly. Um, but for this module itself, it doesn't really matter if it's a slightly bit crooked. But anyway, let's get on with assembling this thing. And I'm not gonna take much footage of the soldering process because, well, yeah, it just takes a longer time that way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put on all the small resistors, the uh, half watts, plus the um, signal diodes. And I've got to be careful because there's two link wires I need to put in. One here and wherever C6 is. It's supposed to be a link that is not there anymore. Hmm. C9, rather, which is somewhere. There is no C9. This is revision B of the circuit board. Maybe he's changed it so it's no longer a capacitor anymore. Because I cannot see C9 anywhere. C8, C10, but there's no C9. I think it was over here somewhere, but I think he's uh, rerouted it so it doesn't need a link wire because it wasn't necessary. I don't know. I cannot see C9, and I've been looking at this for at least a minute and a half now, and I still cannot see it. Anyway, for that link wire there, I'll just use a cutoff of a resistor. Anyway, on with it. Okay, I've run into my first problem. I didn't order any 68k resistors, which I don't think I did, um, which is handy, so I'm going to have to go out to JCAR and buy them separately, something like about 45 cents or some shit, and I've noticed that I've got the wrong value of these ceramic capacitors, these are 220 picofarad, the circuit calls for 120, so I'm going to have to go buy another couple of those too, but so far... That's all I'm missing is the 68K resistors. I thought I ordered them. I'll have to go and recheck my parts list, which is actually on the back of this. Yeah, I did order it. I, well, I did actually have it on this parts list. Hmm. Let me check my other sheet that I've got. Yeah, it's definitely on this sheet. So did I order it or did I not? It's on my delivery slip. 
but I do not see it anywhere, unless I've gone blind. Hmm. I've paid for them, but don't have them. Well, I'm confused. Stupid me. There they are there. I've used one already somewhere, which was, um, yeah, R1. I put 68K there. I forgot to check the rest of the circuit to see if there was another two there. Okay, all good. Yep, I found it. Uh, it was R1 I've put the 68K in, so it's R7 and R12 that I haven't yet. Um, thank God I found it. I've already opened it. Duh. Right, all the small resistors are done. Half watts. I'm up to doing the diodes now, the 1N. 4148s. But I've been bitten before of diodes not working, so I'm going to test them beforehand. Might use my new lead concoction here. I'm on resistance, that's not helpful. Stay on though. Yep. 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 Yep, they work fine. I've had issues with signal diodes in the past being open circuit right out of the gate. So I'll pop these in there. So I'll start with just two of them because it does get awkward soldering when they're that close together. That didn't even solder. That did. I'm actually having fun building this little uh, thing. Board's very easy to work with. It's not overly complicated to do either. I mean, I've spent an hour doing the resistors. That's because I was filming in between and sorting out other stuff, like where those resistors went. So, that's two of them. One's a little proud of the board than it should be. Okay, that fixes that. I'll just trim off that extra excess there. There we go. Now I need to do D3 and D4. I'm not going to do the xenodiodes yet. I'm actually loving this iron. I do need to get another helping hand PCB holder because it is awkward doing it like this, but it can be done. But I'm having fun nonetheless. And it is a great iron. I do recommend this to anyone as a first time iron certainly does do the job so I'm quite pleased with that thanks Danish Dart for that that's great the iron is working I need to get proper electronics side cutters not wire cutters is these are uh, about as useless as having boobs on a ball it's well not useless but it is awkward using that size sort of uh, side cutters. Now, next thing we're going to move on to is the two IC sockets. Yes, I have got IC sockets. Yeah, of course, they're in this little bag of components here. Might as well tip this bag of components out because I'm going to do most likely the capacitors next anyway, the MKTs anyway. I can't do the two ceramic ones because they're wrong. That's all right. Two xenodies will go last. Two IC sockets is what I'm after here. And the reason why I would do these now is because it's still flat. There's no com large components sticking up, so it'll sit nice and flat on the desk so that you can solder them straight. So I'll just tack two ends of the pins. Just double check, make sure they're straight. They look straight to me. I'll just go along and solder the rest of the pins. I mean, I could have used machined IC sockets for this. They're more expensive. They're like a dollar ten each, I think. But the way I see it is, what's the point? Um, having machine pins is nice, yes, because you're guaranteed that the IC is going to sit in there nice and good. Um, but these cheaper dill sockets are perfectly fine. I don't see the need for the expensive machined IC sockets. 
There we go, those two YC sockets installed. Now I can move on to the MKT capacitors. I'd really like to get the opportunity to meet Rod Elliott. He's a decent bloke. Anyway, now, um, now comes the decision whether or not I use PCB pins, which I hate with a passion, because it's awfully awkward getting your soldering iron in there to actually make the joints. I mean, it can be done, but it's just a pain in the ass. Or do I use these sodding connectors that I don't like doing? Well, there's four three ways and one six way. I think I'm going to go the connector route. That way I can uh, make it unpluggable. However, this ground will have to go to the front panel as my star earth. That's where the uh, star earth is going to be done on that front panel. So I might put a PCB pin in just for that, but the rest I'll use connectors. Not that I like doing those connectors, it just makes the project go a lot longer though, doing it that way. But um, yeah, whatever. One. So I paid two dollars and something for that, just for one PCB pin. Oh dear. Alright, well, that did not work at all. That did now stay there. Because the ground wire will be soldered to this point and then soldered to an eyelet at the other end to put it over the screw. There we go, PCB pin installed. A little bit, a little bit crooked, but that's okay. Next, what I might do is I might do the Xano diodes and the two resistors because they've got to be raised up off the board just to in case they get hot they'll get warm in operation so I hope this video is not too long and boring for you but um, I'll try and make some sort of sense of it in editing but I'm going to test the Xeno diodes to make sure that they're conducting all right let's see yeah, I don't know how well you can see that, probably not at all, but we're experiencing 0.629 volt diode drop, so that diode is working. I'll just test this other one. Having these clip leads does make it a little bit easier. Yep, 0.625 volt, so those can go in. Move that out the way. Notice watching back in editing some of my videos that some of them are overexposed because I've got the iris open way too far. I will say now that I do apologize for that. What looks good in the viewfinder isn't necessarily what looks good when it's on the final screen in viewing. So I do apologize that some of my videos may have looked a little bit overexposed in the past. I didn't mean to do it. Uh, I'll try not to. I've also got to stop with the waffling on and just get on to get to the point a little bit quicker but some of you may enjoy listening to me crap on about stuff I suppose so that's what I mean about being proud of the board as you can see if I can get it in some good light there that there's a good four mil gap there which is perfectly fine probably a little bit more than I wanted but as I say it's perfectly fine so I'll just solder the, these guys in so our diode, my soldering iron is not actually hot. I do recommend a pencil tip though, it would probably be my next purchase from Amazon when I get around to it to get a pencil tip for this T12 iron because the, this, this tip is a little bit awkward for smaller electronics like this. It's alright if you're doing heavy soldering like in that um, uh, dummy load that I built using terminal tags and stuff. Now I need my two, <coughs> excuse me, 68 watt, 68 watt, 68 ohm resistors, 1 watt devices. If I can get them out of Z bag. 
お魚そう、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、私も、Yeah, that's my phone. Now I'm putting all these the right way around so the electrons don't fall out. So all the MKT capacitors are done other than those two 120 picofarad capacitors because I don't have them. I didn't realize I ordered the wrong ones. So I'm going to go into JCAR probably tomorrow to pick them up not necessarily the connectors because I don't have the funds available at the moment for that um, until next week so that might have to wait but um, yeah I want to get some other stuff from JCAR too the only reason I did the order online for the components is because I cannot be stuffed anymore crawling around on the floor of JCAR in their component boxes looking for the component I want. I'd rather someone else do it, thank you very much. Um, yes, I had to pay, I think it was $7 for eight. So yes, it's a more expensive way of doing it. But as long as your order is fairly large, like what well, I had a lot of components, well, well, you know. So where's the ground on that? Looks like Okay, so the ground's down here on pin one. That's fine. So with the three-way connector, I could probably put a two-way there. It wouldn't matter because I'm already going to have a separate ground anyway. So I might just get a two-way, three threes, and one six. So what's next? Mon ami. Well, it'll be the capacitors, the electrolytic capacitors now. So I'm going to do that. You don't really need me see me do that. And we'll come back when I'm finished. Okay, one thing I'm going to bring up is with C11, it's not actually marked as po what polarity is what, because really you should have used a bipolar cap there. And I've now just dropped the two microfarad, 2.2 microfarad capacitor somewhere, and I don't know where it's gone. <coughs> me, where did you go? Found it. Anyway, um, the negative side goes towards the front of the board here where the output socket is according to the schematic anyway so that's the way I'm going to insert it and have I got I only got two more capacitors to go two one microfarads and um, that's C8 and C3 I believe C8 C3 can't see where they are either oh, yeah. those two there which are out of, out of shot might make this easier and just cut them off the tag. I really hate pulling them off the tag because it's annoying. Okay, so these are also not have any polarity index on it, but the negative of the capacitor goes towards the ground rail, which is that way for that one. So. Yeah, that goes towards the front of the board for the negative. And this one, I would assume, would be the same. It looks like the negative is facing the same way. So there is a slight modification here. You could probably use bipolar caps for this. Uh, I could actually verify that it is the ground, ground terminal. Might do that. Now this is where an alligator clip lead on a multimeter would come in handy. Because it leaves you free for the other terminal to just touch things. Uh, that's not going to work. Um, what am I doing? That's what I'm doing. That's, that's ground. That's floating. 
That's interesting. Why is that floating? Oh no, there it is. Yep, I've got them the right way around. Um, where I've put them is definitely where the ground is. Oh. Well, what was going on here? Helps to um, hook it. Right, now I can solder those four or five capacitors in. And. Oh, you bastard. I don't know why you weren't soldering, prick. I'm going to solder pine. So did that one. Although I don't like the joint. These other leads off first before I solder those last two because it would be easier to get to without these pigtails in the way. I'll do these two. Like this big blob of solder, like so. That's good. Now, uh, anything else? No, looks fine to me. Right, let's solder these last two leads. Oh, bit better. Right, cut these off. And that, for now, completes the construction. So, that's what it's going to look like when it's finished. I'm going to leave the op amps out of the sockets until it's connected to a suitable supply, and I'm going to measure the voltages between pin 4 and pin 8. Uh, pin 4, pin 8, pin 4, pin 8. Make sure that there is uh, 30 volt there, roughly. And um, before putting them in, because you'll end up blowing the IC sky high if it's the wrong voltage. Anyway, that completes the first part of the construction of this uh, Elliott Sound product, Products uh, guitar preamp. Uh, we'll see you in the next part when I actually wire all the pots and have the connectors and have the replacement capacitors. Anyway, I'm the Astro 30. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to rate, comment and subscribe below. And you can always follow me on Facebook and you can even become one of my Patreons. And uh, you only have to pledge as little as a dollar a month. Any little bit helps. It helps me buy components for this. And also, thank you to the person that PayPal'd me $82 Australian uh, via PayPal before Christmas. That was well appreciated. That allowed me to buy the components. So, <laughs> thank you for that. Anyway, this is Yashra30 saying, see ya, have a great day. See you in part two.